we continue from where we left off, the most essential yoga sutras are the following. We are beginning now with chapter 2 of the yoga sutras, which is called sadhana pada. Sadhana, as the word implies, is practice. And this is the chapter or that part about practice or sadhana. Now that we have the overview of the process of yoga, we find out how a dedicated seeker can gain glimpses of samadhi, the highest state, and reduce the colouring of the ripples of thoughts, mental images, emotions and desires. The author or authors of the Yoga Sutra recommend a combination of tapas, swadhyay and ishvar pranidhan. Before I go into the details, I spoke briefly about this chapter called Sadhana Pada and this is about practice because the very first chapter was the overview. Where are we going? Where do we want to go? We want to go to the highest experience of Samadhi, the highest level of consciousness and you got a whole overview of that process. Now, we go into the details. This is a wonderful tradition of all Indian scriptures that the very first shloka, the very first verse, or in some cases the very first chapter, summarizes the entire book or captures the essence of the book. We mentioned that the very first sutras, the first three or four sutras capture the essence, but also the very first chapter captures the essence of the whole journey. Where do we want to go? Where am I and where do I want to go? That was the first chapter. And the second chapter now goes into the details. What do I have to do in order to get there? It mentions now, in the first few sutras of chapter 2, it mentions Tapas, Subhadhyay and Ishwar Pranidhan. Some of you know the yamas and the niyamas in yoga. The yamas and the niyamas are the first steps of ashtang yoga. The entire chapter 2 outlines the eight steps of ashtang yoga. Ashta means eight, ang means limbs. So think of the body, the human body. We have limbs. How would it be if you didn't have one of your limbs? Obviously, the body is not complete. As a whole, it functions very differently. And that's the idea of limbs, which is very important. When we see a little child learning to walk. You know, at first it begins to crawl and, and then it learns to stand and then it begins to walk. It's, it's fascinating to see that it just doesn't walk just on its legs. It cannot walk if it wouldn't have hands. The child needs the support of the hands and the arms to be able to learn, to balance, to get up, to stand and then begin to walk. So you see there the importance of the limbs as a whole. 
And so also, in Ashtang Yoga, the choice of the word Anga, Ashtanga, was probably not a coincidence. Why did Patanjali not say eight steps of yoga, like a ladder leading to the highest? He did not. He said Ashtanga, eight limbs, indicating that all the limbs have equal importance. They are not to be seen as steps, but an entire process which happens simultaneously, together, as a whole. One of these limbs, generally coming first, is yamas and niyamas. And these three are one of the niya, are among the niyamas. There are five niyamas. Niyamas and yamas, often translated as don'ts and do's, and sometimes many Western translators translate them incorrectly into Ten Commandments. These are not Ten Commandments. Commandments indicate from the word command an order, something you have to do. It's like a law, but we prefer to use the word commitments. The onus is on you. It's not an external authority which tells you what to do and how to do it. It's not an order. It's a commitment from your side. So the onus is on you. And that's the beauty of this system of yoga that it is self-driven. No one can really force you into it. The result of that is very different. So, this is an internal process, self-driven process, and some of the first steps are being now outlined. First is, when we talk about the niyamas, actually comes santosh. Sorry, swacha. Swacha means purity. We are talking here about a lifestyle. How we live our life, a pure lifestyle, pure thoughts, pure ideas, pure action. A, we can say a Vedic lifestyle. A lifestyle where we do not create more external conflicts. We learn to live in harmony with our external world, with our society, with nature, we try to live in harmony. Then comes Santosh. Assuming that you have been living a pure life, a Vedic life, in which you have not created more conflicts for yourself, you will experience a certain amount of contentment. Santosh. When you have both of these, then you have the foundation. You have the foundation to start action so that you can actually understand this reality, the way it is set up. If you don't have this foundation, it is very difficult for you to do sadhana. You can imagine that if you're not happy, if you're not content, if there are many conflicts in your life, if you have many problems, if you're struggling for, in, in areas where, you know, for existence, how can you have the energy to put into this internal research? You're so busy with, perhaps just with survival, so that's why the importance of a good organized lifestyle. Very important for those who are really sincere and want to practice and want to attain 
higher states of consciousness. It's an absolute must. And some people tell me, oh yes, I've been doing this since 20 years. And then I see their lifestyle and I'm quite shocked very often. And then there are people who say, I've been doing this since 20 years, but I've still not really understood it or have not attained anything. Why is that? And then we analyze the situation and the result is very often lifestyle. We have not changed lifestyle. You can do as much action sadhana as you want. But if your sadhana is not based on a firm foundation of a healthy, pure lifestyle, then it is like a seed falling on hard ground. It cannot germinate. The seed must fall on fertile ground, ground which has been prepared. Only then will that seed germinate. Only then will the roots go deep and become firm. Which is why the importance of this Vedic lifestyle cannot be ignored. Once you have that, once you have fulfilled the preconditions, the first step is tapas. Tapas means training the senses, training the mind. And, and I include the body in this. They go together. We cannot go into deeper meditation without training our body, our senses and our mind. A lot of people want to skip this stage altogether. They like to sit down quietly for five minutes and then they say, oh, I was sitting in the silence. That is not silence. That may be a little quiet for a while, but that is not the silence we are talking about. This is not the silence of Samadhi. That's a different silence. So to attain higher states, absolute prerequisite, a pure and healthy lifestyle combined with effort to train the senses and the mind. If the mind is still scattered, pulled outwards continuously, then it becomes very difficult to do any kind of sadhana. Having had some sort of training of the senses, next step is svadhyay. Grasping scriptural knowledge, that is one aspect, because once you start training yourself, you will read the scriptures differently. You will interpret them differently. Those who do not practice and who only read books, and there are many of these people, they enjoy the intellectual stimulation, which is very well, but it does not lead to higher states of consciousness. But when you have done some practice, you have begun the process of self-training, you will grasp the scriptural knowledge. You will have a different understanding. You will interpret them differently. What will happen is that you will also, this Svadhyay, Swa means self, is also the self-knowledge. You are beginning to study yourself. You're not just studying books. You're studying the self. And that's also a very important aspect of Swadhyay. Swadhyay is not merely studying books or studying other people, but becoming self-aware and studying one's own nature, studying one's own body, the own mind, the own senses, and getting to know yourself. How many people can honestly say 
they know themselves. Very few, very few people really know themselves. So that's then the second step. Starting to practice deeper meditation so that you begin to know your, your nature, your own self, and you also get a deeper understanding of scriptures. What the leads to? This leads to Ishwar Pranidhan. This leads to strengthening of these small little direct experiences. Initially, they may be just brief glimpses. But with time, these glimpses strengthen. They come more often. They become more intense. They have a deeper impact on our lives. And they bring then gradually with it a beautiful experience of divinity, of love, this intoxicating love, divine love, and love for all, not, not restricted to some person or something. This all-inclusive love. This is not attachment, this is love. And that is then Ishvar Pranidhan. We see how the process takes us. It's a beautiful process. It's not an intellectual process. It's a beautiful process that we can all go through, provided we practice. Now these three aspects here, Tapas, Swadhyaya and Ishwar Pranidhan, these three together are called Kriya Yoga. This Kriya Yoga is not to be mixed or to be confused with any particular style of yoga, teacher or tradition. The word Kriya simply means action or to do. So this is what you have to do. Therefore, the word Kriya Yoga. And what do you do? Through these three steps, we uncolor the kleshas. In our last session, we mentioned the kleshas. We talked about uncoloring these kleshas. Kleshas is another word for samskara. And klesha means tint, taint, or a stain. It's a stain or a taint. You're tainted. And that's why in English we say coloring. We've translated it as coloring. And we want to uncolor ourselves. There are five basic kleshas. If you analyze all the impressions in your mind, this is a part of Swadhyay. When you start analyzing yourself, start observing yourself, you get to know yourself and you will observe some of these. I'm going to read them backwards. I'm going to begin with point <clears throat> five and say, the fear of death, Abhinavesh, is present in everyone. What is this fear of death? Is it really the fear of physical death? Are we continuously walking around thinking about the fear of death, that we're going to die? That's one aspect. It's very deep in us, the fear of physical death. But there is also the death that is associated with the ego. And this is also a form of death. If I have an identity which says, oh, I am very beautiful, but if I go somewhere and people ignore me, they don't look upon me as beautiful, they just simply ignore me, then that identity is shattered. If I think I'm very intelligent, that's my identity. And if somebody says, you stupid, get out of the way, then I get very upset because 
I, my identity has been questioned. If you are an educated person and you identify with your education and somebody calls you an ignorant person, you don't know anything, then also you'll get very offended. So this is also a form of death. That's when the ego is attacked. And this is present in everyone. So where does that ego come from? What is this ego? What is this egoism that we are experiencing? This egoism has two sides. One is called Dvesha. The other is called Raga. Dvesha means aversion and Raga is attachment. If you study yourself, your mind, your thoughts, your actions, you will find that almost everything you do, you can put in these two categories. Either you enjoy something, it gives you pleasure and you want more of it, or you don't like it. It's painful, it's suffering, and you don't want it. You are averse to it. That's aversion. So almost every thought and every action can be put into one of these two categories. Over here they're given as points three and four. That does not mean that one is more important than the other. They both are like the sides, the twin sides of a coin. They are one. It's just the perspective you look at the coin. If you look at it from one side, it looks unpleasant. If you look at it from another side, it looks very pleasant, very nice. So if you see your attachment to your spouse, your attachment to your children, your attachment to your parents, if you look at it from one side, it's very nice, it's wonderful to have family. I'm sure we all enjoy that, we enjoy the company of our family, yet at the same time, this gives us pain when the person you love does not return your love. When the children become teenagers and they start becoming rude to you. When the parents die, they give us pain. So, we see that in all things, there are two sides to it. And there's Raga and Dvesha. So, all the objects, all the people in our life are creating this suffering and this identities in us. So you have identity. I'm a mother. I'm a husband. I'm a son. I'm a grandfather. I'm a daughter. These are identities. Or an em I'm an employee in a company. Or an identity which says I'm the boss of somebody. All these roles that we play, these are nothing but forms of egoism or identification. So what is that called? That's called asmita or egoism. That's when we think that our sense of discrimination is actually purusha. In fact, it is not. We are, we are mixing up the egoism, ahankara, with buddhi, and we think that buddhi and ahankara are purusha. They are not. They are separate things. So, this egoism is our false identity. And we have many false identities. It depends on your situation. When you're interacting with your boss, you have a false identity of an employee. When you're interacting with your wife, you have a false identity of the husband. When you're interacting with your parents, you have the false identity of a child. In reality, you are none of these.
So what are you? What is this idea that you're none of these? That is ignorance. That is avidya. That's our basic ignorance. That we have mistaken that which is nashwar, transient. Nashwar means that which can be destroyed. We have mistaken the nashwar for something that's eternal and everlasting. But it is nashwar. It's, it's going to be destroyed. It is not permanent. We are mistaking the impermanent for permanent. We, miss, we think our relationships will be always like this. We can't imagine how it is when the parents die. But that's going to happen. We can't imagine how it is when the spouse is going to die. Or maybe it doesn't work out and you get divorced. You don't even want to think about it. When the child is small, you think the relationship is going to remain like this. To the big shock you get when they become teenagers, when they become adults, and then they tell you how you should behave. And that is transient. These relationships are transient. We begin to think that our unhealthy relationships that we have are healthy. Or our unhealthy approach to life is healthy. And we begin to actually believe that this misery we are stuck in is even happiness. So this is the extent of our ignorance or our vidya. You see the process, how it goes. It goes inwards. If you want to uncolor yourself, you have to begin somewhere. And this avidya is the root. A big issue with a lot of people who practice Neo-Advaita. Neo-Advaita means those who keep saying, I am Brahman, I am Atman, I don't need to meditate because I'm already free. I'm already pure consciousness. So, these people, they begin here at this level without actually uncoloring anything. So, they're trying to talk themselves into this, but it does not work. It does not work because these people have the fear of death just like everybody else. But if you were established in pure consciousness, then you would not. So the process goes inwards from Abhinavesh, Dvesha, Raga, Smita to the core, your ignorance. So ignorance or avidya is the root of all pleasures. It is the fertile ground from which all the other kleshas grow and flourish. So they are the result, the other kleshas are the result of the primary klesha, which is ignorance. These kleshas could be in any of the four stages. Once again, four us to understand this better, we go in the reverse order. Active, interrupted, attenuated and dormant or latent. So let us take an example of uh, you have been eating too many sweets, chocolates, ice creams, mitais, cakes, you know all these goodies. And you have put on too much weight. So you have to stop. <laughs> you have to stop eating these goodies. Now when you are eating this, your desire for the sweets and chocolate is active. That's the klesha that's called active. Now you realize, I have to stop. I have to go on a diet. What has happened to the klesha? It is interrupted. It's not gone. You have just interrupted it. You have said, no, no more sweets, no more chocolates. I'm going to go on a diet. Let's say that you manage over a certain amount of time 
to not indulge and over a certain period of time you find that your desire for these sweets and chocolates and all these other goodies has actually decreased that your mind is not so preoccupied with these things anymore you're not thinking about you know every afternoon maybe at 4 o'clock suddenly you're not thinking about sweets you know or whatever after meals if you have a dessert you're not thinking about sweets suddenly you realize that these sweets don't have such a strong hold on you that means the klesha is attenuated now let's say you have not had sweets in a long long time a couple of years because you just lost the desire for them completely you just lost the desire what happened to that it is dormant latent it is there but it is sleeping and so your glaciers at any point of time could be in any of these stages of coloring these are covering nine sutras the first nine sutras of chapter 2 samadhi pada are probably the most important sutras that we don't that we need to know in order to have really good meditation to be successful in understanding ourselves and gaining insights into who we are if you have difficulties understanding these then you are going to have problems in your practice any questions any comments any thoughts on this some experiences maybe from people no comments from anybody no questions um is practice an intellectual process is that a question no of course not practice or sadhana means learning how to meditate it means beginning first with changing your lifestyle it means eating healthy food it means going for walks or, or taking care of your body it means practicing simple things like ahimsa don't lie don't um hurt people or harm people with with rude words don't try to you know grab things which don't belong to you if that somebody else's respect other people's property these are the the yamas which i am talking about now don't uh, buy things and collect things that you don't need try to lead a simple life all this is part of practice sadhana the other part is learning actual meditation so one is meditation in action which is leading a lifestyle a healthy lifestyle a pure lifestyle and the other aspect is learning to meditate it means how to sit in meditation and go slowly inwards so that you can attain what the great sages of india have attained for yourself it's not just reading books and saying oh nice that is bhakti uh in the form of you know experiencing maybe uh, 
devotion, ritualistic approach. It's not a ritual. We are not talking about rituals here. It's a process of going inwards and learning dhyana. Dhyana is meditation. With a teacher from an unbroken lineage. So that what you learn is authentic and not just some thing put together by somebody, but some process which has gone, has been tried and tested since thousands of years. We are from represent the lineage of Samaya Sri Vidya, which is over 6,000 years old. So we are speaking from that experience and handing this down in an unbroken lineage to people who want to learn meditation and who want to know themselves. There is nothing intellectual about this. This is not about reading books. For those of you who are on Facebook, I post uh, from Swami Rama and one of the very nice things which I posted just a couple of days ago was a comment where he says, we, we don't care if, how many books you have read. We want to know if you are an insider. Insider means somebody who goes inside and he knows how to meditate and gets to know his own thoughts, his own mind his own feelings, his own emotions. Some of us go to sleep at night, you get up in the morning, you don't remember what you did. You don't even remember a single dream. What, what happened? You don't know. One third of your life is gone in complete ignorance. So that is what we are talking about. Meditation is not an intellectual process. Sadhana is not an intellectual process. Okay. If there are no other questions, then I will continue. So, in meditation, what do we do? We are looking at our colorings. What are these colorings? The thoughts. So, coming back to the example that I used of sweets and chocolates. And this klesha has got very active now in you. And you're, you're continuously thinking about chocolates or sweets or ice creams. And uh, now you say, hmm, what do I do about this? So the, the, the Yoga Sutras say, we need to deal with this coloring. We need to deal with this thought which has become so active. So the deepest of colored thoughts, this attachment to sweets, no? we're talking about raga here. It's a pleasure of enjoying the sweets. So this is the deepest of colored thoughts. Mental images, you see a wonderful, gorgeous, dark brown chocolate. It's maybe it's just melting and you have this great mental image. And you have emotions coming up. And, you know, you feel good after having a really nice, delicious chocolate or ice cream. And you have this great ice cream and you really enjoy licking it slowly and it just gives you a certain sense of happiness, satisfaction. Even, yeah, you feel content somehow. This sweet taste makes you just feel good. Maybe it reminds you of your childhood when you went with your family for a treat and you looked forward to it and you just felt so good, you know, and happy with the whole family. So it comes with a memory, perhaps. These are emotions. And then that desire somewhere inside of you, that ice cream has become, it has become, you know, bigger. It's become, the chocolate has become darker and sweeter and, and seems to melt. So you can imagine 
this is happening in the mind okay there's all these thoughts and it's so colored because it's so intense the attachment and the attachment is filled with so many different things it's not just words but their images their emotions and it's it just has a power to take over you completely you can get so obsessed with this chocolate or this ice cream that you cannot concentrate on anything else so what can you do well if if that desire is not very very powerful if it's not a very very primitive basic thing like your love for ice cream chocolate this this is considered to be superficial this can be uncolored through meditation so superficial mild colored thoughts images emotions and desires can be dealt with in meditation they become not colored what does it mean not colored that means here this dormant latent one i looked at the ice cream and i just said okay fine it's not so great after all i was able to control myself and i didn't indulge and then after some time the desire somehow just miraculously inexplicably disappeared it's uncolored we have to be very careful there that this uncolored or not colored is is not always dormant it could also be just interrupted they are very similar a lot of people say oh yeah i don't need to have have this anymore you know i'm done with it i used to love to have you know tea and coffee i was in fact even addicted to it but now i'm done with it now are you really done with it or is it just interrupted and it's just gone deeper in your mind where it's still there so interrupted and dormant this can be a very similar situation so that's a kind of a pitfall that's a danger that we can get into for those who meditate the other deepest thoughts mental images emotions desires these can be burned in the fire of knowledge there is no other way these have to be this is the basic this has to be burned there is no other way out we the yoga sutras or tradition uses the example of a cloth there are some stains on it that's why the word klesha comes hmm? klesha means stain so if there's a cloth and there are stains on it what do you do you wash it off and you just put it maybe in the wash you put it in the washing machine and if there are very mild stains they will just go first wash and they're gone but what if there are very stubborn stains then what do you do then you have to take that individual stain and that stain maybe you have to take a soap and rub it or you have to get a special chemical thing to treat that stain so that you remove that stain because it's a very stubborn stain so extra time effort and care is required to get rid of these stubborn stains it's the same process in meditation the more superficial coloring we can get rid of through meditation but the basic we cannot and what is that basic that is ahankara itself it is not an i small identity but it's the identity of i am i am somebody you know and that is a very big one and that is always blocking us so also very deep ancient memories they are also very deep they don't go in just normal meditation but they come up the final stage when you are going to become a witness and they come up and 
and they're burnt in that fire of knowledge. Okay, so this is the process of deeping, dealing with deeper coloring. It's not something that will just go very easily. These are stubborn stains. Any questions about stubborn stains? Okay, good. Then we continue. We continue to how exactly to break this alliance. Ah, yes, okay. Yes, Survi? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, I'm having some problem here in the connection, so. Okay. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask about that uh, like stains yeah and uh, you said like it will be there like it will take more time and effort for mm -hmm. uh, you know going off that stubborn stain mm -hmm. uh, so this means that uh, this will go only in the like you know uh, later like um, in the final like many many years and till that time we have to deal with it in meditation you know think of it, it think think of it as layers there are layers, you know, like the mind has layers. Now, one of the layers we, we talk about is waking, dreaming, deep sleep. But generally, mm. when you are, as you are talking to me now, you're listening to my voice, you know, and that's what your main, what you're aware of. But in the meantime, mm. around you, maybe there are also things happening, you know, if you look out of the window, there's life, things are happening. But you're not so aware of mm. these things. So when you start meditation, it's a similar process. Initially, you become aware of certain things because they are milder in coloring. They are not very deep. So the, the milder things will come up first. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a natural process. That which is not very deep will, will, will come up first. And as you look at those things, they may be, for example... Yes, uh, I use the example of sweets, you know, my love for sweets and chocolates and all this. Thoughts will keep coming and disturbing you. Then some people want to have a career and they're worried. Oh, what will happen in my job? So these thoughts will come. So that will be the thoughts will come. You know, these are superficial day-to-day -day things. And these come first. And these things we can deal quite well in meditation. But there are deeper aspects that we may not be able to deal with. And they take longer time, take more practice, they take experience. And for example, if there's somebody who says, I, I feel I don't like myself. You know, I, I feel I'm a worthless person. And uh, nobody respects me, nobody loves me. This, for example, is a deep, deep emotional issue, which is not something that even resolve very easily. Understand that? Yeah. You understand the difference? I can maybe uh, say I'll buy myself good clothes, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that I feel good about myself. Some people may say, oh, you look nice. And maybe for a moment I feel better. But then again I feel, oh, people don't respect me. People don't love me. You know, this mm. that self-worth is something that everybody has. I didn't use this example by coincidence. I use this example because it's a common problem. It's not a common problem. It's actually a fundamental human problem. All of us have this. That is what makes us human. And because we have this feeling deep inside of us, I'm not worthy of things. I, nobody loves me, no one cares for me. We separate ourselves from others. We do not 
uh, allow ourselves to enjoy life and because we feel separate from others we experience a deep loneliness you can surround yourself with 100 people but you will still feel lonely you know we say in english being lonely in a crowd that's how we all feel we all feel very separate and alienated so human existence is like that so this is a very deep rooted problem which comes from ahankar itself and that cannot go until that very last stage when is is all burned in the fire of knowledge where you realize you are atman and you identify with atman and then all all your <laughs> problems gone in one stroke all suffering ends because you are no longer two but you are one you're not divided you have become one and when you are one there's no fear there's no suffering no loneliness no that peace okay and uh, yeah i want to talk some other thing also uh, the desires which we have they are also like creations yeah you know, they also come under like creations yes desires are basically a form of creation yeah okay so but it may be categorized yes they can be categorized you know they normally come under raga no that's attachment so that's okay. a form of desire i you know i want this or i want that it's normally coming under mm-hmm. raga so that's a desire you want something okay yes okay thank you okay okay so that was a, a nice um, discussion the next step is the sutras 12 to 25 and these require much more deeper understanding and require much more time therefore i think it's best that we continue in our next session as you can see it's also quite long so we should continue this in our next session since we are running out of time in this session for the for the entire to do justice to it we shall continue in our next session anybody has any other questions or comments or so then we can take the question if not we end it here okay it seems that uh, there are no questions and uh, in that case i would suggest we end this session here we continue next friday with the yoga sutras 12 to 25 and i hope you all have a nice weekend and um, bye bye